Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson from Four Corners of the Board, and today I'm going to be having a look at Wendake. Now when I saw this game on the game shelf, I was intrigued by the theme. There are very few games where you take the role of a chief of a Native American tribe. So right off the start, that piqued my interest. And when I was looking at the back of the box and the rule book and seeing the action selection mechanism through the selection of tiles when they all shift down, that looked also different as well. And honestly, when I opened the box and saw all the components, I'll admit I was eager to get this one to the table. So, do all of these points make a good game? Let's get to the table, see how it's played, then we'll come back for my final thoughts on Wendake. So here's Wendake on the table. I'm not going to go through all the components, as there are a lot of them, but I will mention them at a very high level. The player board is set up depending on the number of players, and the score tracks are placed on the side of the board and the scoring categories are randomized. All the progress tiles are laid out based on their level. The mass cards are shuffled and the first one is discarded. The first player token is given to the first player, then each player is given their starting components including their nine basic action tiles. Players will then choose their tribe in a draft style. Each player will place a canoe in the lake on the board, five warriors inside the productive area, five women and five hunters in two piles on their respective productive areas, and keep the other components in their longhouses. To set up your player board, place the sacred fire in the middle, then randomly place the other eight tiles around it. Place your discs on the different tracks, You'll randomly set up a number of advanced action tiles based on the player count, as well as the turtle tiles, which is also based on the player count. Finally, place the year marker on year one. Now the game is played over seven years, with each year split into two phases, the player phase and the restore phase. In the player phase, each player will take an action until each player has taken four actions. You will either activate an action tile or reserve a turn order spot. You will always do three tiles and one reserve actions per round. The first time during the year, you may pick whatever action tile you want by placing an action marker on it, but all subsequent tiles of that year must be chosen in the line from the first tile. So, if you pick this action tile as your first action, the other action tiles you can choose during the year are these. Now instead of picking an action tile, you can reserve turn order by placing your action marker on the turn track. Now since the action tiles are the heart of the game, let's go over the actions you can take. The canoe action allows you to place a new canoe into a lake and all lakes are the same for gameplay purposes. The harvest and hunt action allows you to gain resources from each productive area where you have natives. Women in fields get you one vegetable resource, and hunters in the forest get you a beaver. The tan pelts action allows you to convert all of your beavers into pelts. Using the fishing action allows you to collect one fish for each canoe you have in a lake. The mask ceremony is done in two steps. First draw a card or take the top card off the discard deck and add it to your hand. You may then play any combination of mask cards that matches an empty space in the mask ceremony section. Score that many mask points and leave your cards face up in front of you. The trade action has three steps to it. The first is you may exchange goods with the game. You can exchange one resource for every canoe you have deployed. Whenever you do an exchange, you must flip over the top card of the mask deck and look at the blanket section. If it is infected, you must remove one of your natives from the board into your longhouse. If it's not infected, nothing happens. Then you can buy one progress tile and play the resources depending on the level of the progress tile. You'll gain economic points based on its level, and you'll also score points on another track depending on what the progress tile says at the bottom. Once purchased, you then have the ability to buy more economic points by spending up to 5 resources and gaining that many economic points before the trade action is over. The Sacred Fire action allows you to take any other action on your board that you would not normally be able to take based on your first tile selection or tiles you want to take later in that year. You then place the Sacred Fire token on that chosen action. If any of your action tiles are flipped, you will be able to take the Ritual action. You will move any two natives from your longhouse to your home territory and score Ritual points equal to the least common type of native, Hunter, Warriors, or Women. Now, movement is a little more complicated, I'm going to briefly summarize it. You get movement points, and each movement point allows you to move a warrior to an adjacent territory, and only warriors can move. Now, when you move a warrior, a warrior can, can be placed in one of two ways. Lay down inside a productive area and turn into an outpost, which means he cannot be moved again, but can be replaced after your movement action with a woman or a hunter. Or, the warriors can be placed standing up, which means they are a guard. They will protect a productive area 
where they are placed from an attack. Fighting can only occur during the move action and can only occur when your warrior is in a territory with other tribes' natives, either warriors, women, or hunters. You can attack a guard, but it is a one-to-one injury ratio, with each injured warrior guard going back to their respective longhouses. If you attack a productive area with a woman or hunter, that woman or hunter is injured and returned to their longhouse. Your warrior now becomes an outpost. If the productive area has one or more guards, you must battle the guards first before you can attack the women or hunter using the same one-for-one rule and returning injured guards and warriors to their longhouses. Now the last action you can take is the military action, and again this has two steps. First, you can claim turtle tiles based on your productive areas or canoes. You cannot claim two identical turtle tiles. Once a turtle tile is claimed, you claim one military point for each territory where you have the most guards. That is all the possible actions you can take, and again, I've given you a very high level of these actions. Once all the players have taken their actions, we move to the refresh phase. You'll adjust turn order, then flip all of your chosen action tiles to their other side and remove your action markers. You will then move all your tiles down one row so that three fall off. Then in the new player order, players can set aside one of the three tiles that just came off and replace it with one of the six available ones. If you take one, you replace it with the next one off the deck. Now you're going to shuffle these three tiles and place them randomly back onto your board in the top row. Then you'll move all the mask markers back to the start and advance the year marker. After the seventh year, the game is over. The players will add up their points. First, add up all your turtle tiles. Then, for each pair of tracks, you'll add the lower point value of each pair to your score. Then, whomever has the most points is the winner. Now let's get back to see what I thought about Wendake. So let's have a look at theme and components. First off, I really like the theme. It does something different. Yes, it does cover up the fact that really a big piece of the game is all resource collection, but you know what? Here it makes sense. The action tiles you're doing also make sense, and for me, when I talk about theme, I love when what you're doing mechanism-wise matches with the theme so well. Now, how you select your actions may not be a perfect thematic sense, but I like the mechanism, so for me it was easy to overlook that. Now the components are, well, plentiful. There are no cube resources here, and I appreciate that all the resources uh, wouldn't, are wooden pieces. They look like something real, like a fish and a, and a pelt. Now the only question I have is why the beavers are uh, cardboard chits, but I'm assuming due to the quantity of beavers in the game, it's probably just a, a cost issue. The other resources are good quality too. The action tiles are, are nice and thick. Um, I like that your player board it's kind of a two level, don't know if you can see it, but there's a lip that kind of runs around the outside here. So when you place your action tiles, you know, they nice and, and fit in. So all in all, high marks for the theme components. So on to the gameplay. Now every time I taught this game and I start to go through the action tiles, you know what, people seem to be a little afraid. But once they realize it all just kind of makes sense, teaching is much easier. The only slightly tricky action is, is the movement. Guards versus outposts versus fighting. But you know what, people tend to pick that up quickly though. My favorite mechanism of the game, though, is the action board. The fact that you have to select your actions in a line makes some, uh, for some very interesting decisions. And with the shifting down and selecting the new tile and rounding and placing them back across the top turned out for me and my group probably the most interesting aspect of the game. The only aspect of the game where I got the most question was, was really, wait, uh, how do I get these points again? But again, after a few rounds, people just understood. Now, speaking of points, the way the scoring tracks are randomized. Now I understand why they did that. I'm just not 100% convinced that it's necessary. Since you always score the lesser of the pair of the two scoring tracks, it does mean that you have to do a little bit of everything. You can't specialize in, let's say, the mask ceremony, because mask maximizing in one track usually means you're ignoring the other half of the scoring track. And when the final scoring happens and you're taking the, the lesser of the two tracks, you know, you can't, you can't ignore one thing. I also like that although there were several ways to get points, the steps to gain points were not overly complicated. You want to get points through trading? Get some resources and take the trade action. You want to get mask points? Take the mask option and draw cards and play cards. Get points. Easy. Now there is some player interaction to the move actions. When you move into a territory, you can attack another tribe. And you will probably have to do this during the game to make sure you can get more resource. But you know what? It's not overly punishing. The player who lost their natives will have to take the ritual action on a later turn to get them back into their field. But doing that gets them points. So yes, it is a setback from where you are on the game board, but losing combat never seems to be overly punitive because you're going to get points for it. 
Now, each of the tribes does come with a special action, but there's an option to play where everyone plays the same tribe. I would highly recommend you play with the asymmetrical tribes as soon as possible, as it does change up the game, and I'm really glad that they're there. Now, as for the main mechanism of the game, I think that if you like that mechanism, you're probably going to like the game. I found it to be an interesting way to plan your actions. Having to select actions in a straight line, then having to flip them over and drop off at the end of the round makes for some interesting planning. But luckily, you know what? There's no bad actions to take during a round. Just about everything will get you points or get you towards getting points. And this definitely keeps the analysis paralysis down in the games I've played. I really, really enjoyed that mechanism. So after all that, I think you can probably tell that I enjoyed Wendake. I like that it's a different theme. I like the main mechanism of the game. I like the end game scoring, and I like the asymmetrical powers the different tribes gave you. Now the upgrades were interesting, although the extra points you got from them seemed a little artificial, but that's fine, I know it's a gameplay thing. So I would recommend this game. This is one you should get and play, as it has a lot of th good things going for it. It makes it a fun experience, and that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.